Good afternoon. I'd like to um, warmly welcome the online audience to the session on a new vision for job creation, part of the World Economic Forum's Jobs Reset Summit. I'm Jennifer Shanker, Editor-in-Chief of The Innovator, a global publication about digital transformation. We learned this morning with the release of the forum's job report that automation is proceeding at a pace even faster than anticipated and that unemployment in developed economies is projected to rise from 5.4% at the start of this year to 12.6% by the end of the year even as there continues to be growth in the so-called jobs of the future. We are going to be discussing what can be done urgently to invest in future job creation and support transitions to the jobs of the future. We have four experts on our panel. We have Nicholas uh, Marsakal, Chief Executive Officer of Grupo Magnus, Michael Predos, Chief Executive Officer of Fathom in Australia, and Hamoun Ektiari, CEO of Future Fit AI in Canada. I'd like to kick off our discussion with you, Nicholas. How is your company dealing with workers during the pandemic? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer, Jennifer, and thank you all. I'm very glad to be here with you and share some of our insights in what we've done and the situation we faced. Uh, in Latin America, we faced uh, a very uh, dire uh, situation with unemployment, which was even uh, above um, 8% last year and growing, and also with a, a, um, a very slow economy. So the situation is also uh, more tense. Um, there's lack of inclusiveness, lack of growth, underutilization, um, decreasing work out, uh, quality, a growing informal economy, and inequalities in, in access to work and work quality and income inequality. So with all these situations in, in our part of uh, our cell as we participate in the economy as a company, we, we uh, set out a plan to see how can we work this out. So in, instead of uh, backing out and cutting jobs, uh, Jennifer, what we've really done is look, uh, follow the workforce principles, many of them from, from, from the web, which relates to the first part of this planning. We set up a 2025 plan, and we started this in the month of August. One could say, how can you be planning when you cannot know what's going to happen next week or, or even tomorrow? However, we have to reshape that plan a couple of times. And we saw great opportunities, not only in our Mexico market, but also in the US and also in Latin America. So we set out a time to see how can we grow our business in different markets and grow our business in different parts of the value chain. We're developers of infrastructure and real estate. And we saw opportunities, not only uh, for participating with our suppliers, which um, we were very hard hit with the situation. Uh, jobs were closed for two months. So we set out a plan also with civil society and other non-for-profits to help us, uh, the most needed uh, construction workers. So we provide the support uh, in terms of a short-term support for their basic needs. That, that was an interim uh, effect. And what we saw is we needed to create jobs by also creating more, more works and more projects. So we touched also with the government and provided some alternatives of new schemes of new projects. So we pushed on the uh, public-private partnerships and the government in particular in Mexico uh, launched a new uh, infrastructure uh, program. So that helped in the macro sense uh, to, to also have more projects. The other thing we um, worked a lot, Jennifer, on communication. Uh, these are very uh, tough times psychologically because some people have lost their jobs, even if they remain with their jobs in Marnos, their uh, partners or spouses might have lost, lost their jobs. So we provided some support and also some programs with a foundation called Fundación Paraguaya, which provides also some schemes of other family members who could develop some interim 
type of jobs. So that also helped. We focused a lot on the employment experience. How are they uh, dealing with working from home? And also some of our uh, colleagues which work in uh, work centers, namely hospitals, and two of our hospitals have been devoted to COVID. So it was also a very tough situation. So we've also been uh, very much in touch with them. Also in toll roads, they deal a lot with the, with the public and we've been able to maintain many of those, those toll ro uh, road jobs. We've done some uh, automation in the toll collection, but we've been dealing with having both parts, also maintaining some of the toll uh, road operators. So we've designed our work both uh, still uh, having those jobs for the communities in, in the toll roads, which are low income, and also providing some technology. So we've been able to balance, uh, Jennifer, some part of the short-term concerns and the longer-term concerns. Um, creating new jobs, we started new ventures, uh, for instance, in our hospitals, uh, hospital, uh, hospital information systems. So we have developed that part but also we provide some other types of services which require um, more jobs, namely, um, I mean, um, the part of the, the, the restaurant and also food for the, um, for, for the patients and also some maintenance uh, work. So we've been able to maintain some more of the traditional jobs and some more of the high tech jobs. That's part of what we've been doing with this uh, handling the pandemic, uh, Jennifer. Thank you so much for that comprehensive view of um, how you are handling both short term like emergency measures with long term planning and how you're working with the government. I think that's a perfect um, segue to our next speaker. I'd like to um, introduce um, Carlos Alexandre de Costa, uh, Deputy Minister for Productivity, Employment and Competitiveness in Brazil's Ministry of Economy and co-chair of Closing the Skills Gap Accelerator, a program launched in Davos 2020 under the forums Shaping the Future of the New Economy and Society platform. Welcome, Deputy Minister. Um, a just released uh, World Economic Forum Ipsos survey of more than 12,000 working adults in 27 countries found that more than half are concerned about losing their jobs in the next 12 months. But currently only 21% of businesses report being able to make use of public funds to support their employees through the transition process, according to the forum's jobs report, which was released this morning. What, in your view, should government be doing to uh, ensure that workers remain employable during these difficult economic times? And what areas, in your opinion, need investment in order to create jobs? Jennifer, uh, thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much for, uh, for conducting this, this meeting. Let me just give you a little bit, a glimpse of what we have done during the pandemic, because right now Brazil is uh, recovering very fast. Uh, for instance, our industrial production in Brazil accumulated from January to September is already, has already reached the same level of the, last, of the same period last year. And uh, in the edge, we are growing two digits in comparison to the same month of last year. We are already growing, but there were two things that we have done during the pandemic which uh, have worked really well. First, we have created an emergency benefit, which is equivalent to an employment insurance for those companies that decided to um, uh, suspend their job program, the, 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 the job of their workers. So instead of the government paying employment insurance, the government would keep their employees and government would pay up to the ceiling of the unemployment insurance. Right now, 15 million Brazilians are under this program, and which ends right now, this month. And there is the commitment of the company to keep these jobs for the same period of time that the, the employees received the insurance during this time. So this has uh, helped companies to maintain their workers. And in such a way, the recovery process is much faster because they don't need to 
uh, uh, hire and retrain and, and induce the employees to, the, to these companies. The second thing is a huge credit program, especially for small and medium-sized businesses. It's the largest program we've ever, ever had here in Brazil. Right now, we are already reaching $25 billion, which have been conceded to companies in three months in credit that will be repaid during three years. Uh, and this is in, in including companies in the financial markets. 60% of these companies, this is very focused in small companies, had never got credit for any kind of financial institution before. And right now they are building their credit history. So this is also an institutional advance for our economy. So with money to recover the production, with the employees capped, we are resuming growth really fast right now. And this, is the, this has been built with the whole private sector. But some problems uh, we already faced before. Unemployment was high, even though it was decreasing, it was high before. And it was high, and it still is high. We have uh, 12 million unemployed people in Brazil. We used to have 10 in the beginning of the pandemic, now we have 12. And it, it is high for two main reasons. First of all, the cost of hiring people in Brazil is too high. And we know that this, it is high also in other developing economies. The payroll taxes are high. Uh, the, the, all the bureaucracy of hiring people is stringent. And we are working to reduce that in the tax reform that we are implementing right now. We need to reduce the cost of hiring people in Brazil and also in other economies for the companies. Companies need to hire easily their employees. So we are working, we are finalizing a package right now to propose to the Congress. But we are also working with job matching and job skills. And in the job skills, we're working the world, with the World Economic Forum, the Job Skills Accelerator, uh, in order to implement a huge program of uh, skilling people here in Brazil. And we are working mainly with private sources of funding. And, and why is that? First of all, here in Brazil, we have the Sistema S, a system which uh, has uh, 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 received some compulsory resources from companies, equivalent to 2% of the payroll. We are planning to reduce that, but redirect all these resources to a huge job skills uh, program in the whole country. More than 8 million people will be trained in 300 hours program in the next two years here in Brazil, in different levels with these resources. We, and this is going to be made with results orientation. We're going to do this comparing test groups and control groups to make sure that the employability of those people is much higher than those that do not go through these training programs. So accountability of these programs is very important. In the past, we have spent billions of dollars in programs that did not work we need to make sure that the results are going to be obtained. And, and also in private programs from companies, for instance, Microsoft has just donated yesterday, we announced this yesterday, 5.5 million courses, 5.5 million courses for Brazilians, free, enough from computer literacy up until into artificial intelligence. In, in various levels, we are working very closely to companies here to bridge the skills gap. It's not a government problem, it's a society problem. It's a problem of stakeholder capitalism as uh, the World Development, Development Forum, all, uh, World Economic Forum all says. We, it, it's a problem that the whole society needs to get together because government is limited in terms of resources and knowledge about what needs to be done. So the private sector needs to work with us. Several other companies are also donating uh, skills programs to, to, to this boost that we, we, we are planning. And finally, we are revising, we have a job matching service here in Brazil, government service here in Brazil, which is really outdated. And we managed to have donations from the private sector. And right now, Microsoft is, has also donated a transition to a new system with profiling of, all, of everybody. We have 25 million people in this system right now. Also certification of skills of these people and using artificial intelligence to match the demand and the supply of jobs. Right now, the, we have two great problems in Brazil. The turnover, which is really high. Last year, we have had a growth in employment of 1 million people, but 15 million people have been fired and 16 million people have been hired. 
So this, this increases a lot of frictional unemployment. The faster we can make to reduce the period of time people get, are in employment to find a job, and the more we increase the tenure of people in their jobs by skilling those people, we are going to solve the unemployment problem. And this will be done, is being done right now really fast. We are advancing and we are working with the private sector. I think this is key for us, stakeholder capitalism in practice, and we are really happy to work with the World Economic Forum in the Skills Accelerator Program. Okay, thank you so much, Deputy Minister. I think this is a great transition to our two panelists, uh, Michael and Hamoun, who both run startup companies that use technology that are helping people to transition um, and fit in into what you were just discussing. Um, I think both of them argue that we need new approaches and online courses are great. They're an important part of the mix, but um, more needs to be done to um, map the skills that people already have to the new jobs of the future. So um, maybe uh, Hamoun, you can start and then Michael uh, to, to, to talk about that question. Sure, thank you, Jennifer, and a pleasure to be here. Uh, perhaps just a few highlights of how we're seeing companies and governments take action around this. And we've got some uh, great examples of that on the, on the panel here. I think what COVID has done in, in its uh, acceleration of the impacts both on people and on jobs is really pulled, that, pulled back the curtain on how ready a given company, a given government, a given region is for needing to go through fast and rapid transitions. Um, the forum also released the uh, jobs report that today and what it speaks to is what the deputy minister also spoke to, which is new job creation and yet job destruction. And so I think uh, the, the two elements that are critical in solving for this is one, where do the new jobs come from? And I think one of the things we're seeing significantly is yes, of course, there are the sexy tech jobs, but there is a group of what we see in the data uh, and describe as the hidden good jobs that often don't nearly get the level of attention they need and deserve, but they are from a new job creation perspective, significantly larger pools of opportunities and much more accessible to a larger pool of individuals uh, to, to be able to get to. So those are opportunities in healthcare, in education, in, in the likes of, for example, even in technology, not just becoming a data scientist, but becoming a Salesforce, Salesforce administrator, for example. So I think we've just on the job creation side, on the destination of where people are going, we've got to expand the set of the possible from only the very, very high tech jobs that end up in headlines of reports. And then the second thing is we see companies look at what has happened and realize for years they've talked about reimagining recruiting, reimagining learning and development, but not having at all touched what has been in the headlines every day around layoffs. And so increasingly a shift from we will, that's too taboo and we're not gonna touch it and we're not gonna talk about it to the reality of our new world, our significant workforce transition. And as Nicholas spoke to this, how can we get creative through a multi-lever approach of what we think of as integrated reskilling and outskilling? So it's not about protecting a single job because we can't predetermine that, but it is about protecting people and helping them land softly wherever they go next. Similarly, on the government side, realizing employment services and the deputy minister uh, and the, the work his team has led uh, is, is really a leading example around this of not only saying, look, this system is not good enough for the new reality of the world, but also saying for us to solve this, we need to make our data widely accessible. And, and the deputy minister has, and uh, he, he didn't have a chance to speak to it today, but open up APIs to data sources to say, come, come to this data and help us solve for what those transition pathways look like. The final thing perhaps I'll, I'll finish with is the double-edged sword of AI, right? So uh, unfortunately, most of the discussion ends up being the techno optimist talking about AI will solve the future, let it deal with it. And the other side saying AI is going to de uh, destroy everything. The reality is it can be used on both sides. So we can, and we see this 
in working with both companies like Royal Bank of Canada, as well as with governments in, uh, in Europe, North America, and, and, and East Asia, is AI can then be used if targeted effectively to think of an AI powered GPS for your career. So locate where you're starting from in terms of skills and interests, map destinations of where you could go where the sources of new job creation are, and then connect you to the learning, training, coaching, support, health and wellness supports you need to make that transition successfully. Thank you so much, Hamoun. Michael, I'd like to turn to you uh, now. I mean, in, in the past, you, when you and I have talked, you know, what, what, what happens quite often is uh, companies look at this in, in, in a kind of black and white way and, and they, they say, well, you know, we, we need to cut people in our accounting department, but then we need to go out and find these cybersecurity experts. Um, when in fact, maybe some of the people in the accounting have the, the skills uh, the basic skill sets to become cybersecurity experts if they had a bit of training. So how do we, how do we sort of make sure that uh, companies are not just thinking about laying off people in the old roles, but leverage the skills of the people they already have and help to transition them into new roles? And secondly, I'd love for you to talk about how your company's technology um, you know, basically anticipates how different things like COVID and AI and robotics will will impact uh, job jobs going forward, and maybe give us a glimpse of what you see uh, as the as the road ahead in terms of uh, job creation. Great. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and um, thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to take part. Um, two big questions. I might do the second one first. Um, maybe before we get into where the job, jobs are being created, let's just level set on where we all are at. So Fathom's working with companies and governments in 26 countries on these issues at the moment. Um, and until January, the, there was an evolving, but I think quite increasingly widespread view that the future of work is not the end of jobs, it's a rapid outscale transition. And that's really coming to the piece that you said there about how accountants become cyber analysts, but we'll get to that in a second. COVID has, has obviously had a huge impact in terms of how um, companies and governments around the world are tackling this. And I think really in three main, main forms. Firstly, the rush to remote working. Now this is creating opportunities for companies to deploy technologies to enable remote working, but obviously also creating productivity issues. But increasingly around the world, we're seeing companies bring people back to the office. And this is then changing the nature of real estate. It's meaning that companies are going about workplace redesign and it means that the way that teams are now being considered is actually different. And we've seen a real acceleration in some of the trends that companies have been thinking about over the last few years as they redesign the workplace around the new workforce. Secondly, the COVID driven recession has led to increasingly often what we're seeing described as K-shaped recoveries, where the future, the, the outcome of that recession is not the same for every industry. So the conventional thinking at the beginning, and, and we heard politicians all over the world say there would be a V-shaped recovery. We would go in hard, we'd shed jobs, there'd be productivity problems, and then we'd come out. And that's not actually what we're seeing. What we're seeing is that most companies, most industries went down, some are staying down, and some are coming up, depending on the industry and the economy that they're in. Technology, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, professional services, a lot of those industries are in ascendance, even during the recession. They're busy because of the recession. Other, other industries, retail particularly, are staying down and probably going to stay down for a while. What this means is that when we then think about the recessionary effect in different economies, we've now got to look at fiscal policy and economic policy in each economy. Again, the way that different countries tackle jobs and the way they've tackled stimulus measures has created very different effects. In the US, um, the, the first round of stimulus went to the individual worker, and this led to a massive drop in the number of jobs. In the UK, stimulus was applied to companies, and this allowed companies to retain workers. So we're seeing very different effects. And unfortunately, what that means is a complicating factor. If we look at telecoms worldwide, in January, you'd have said that telcos worldwide had very similar needs and issues. But today, Verizon, British Telecom, Telefonica, and Sintel because of a combination of different recessionary effects in those countries and different economic policies now need different types of, of, of solutions. 
The key message here is that no longer one size fits all. We need to really understand what the specific needs of different industries and different economies are. And as Hamin says, that requires good data. The third effect that we're seeing is what we're describing as a slingshot. So COVID-19 has been a slingshot in technology terms to 2023, to 2025 perhaps. We've seen companies deploy things like robotic process automation at a level of scale that no one would have imagined 12 months ago. Most large companies around the world were experimenting with these technologies are now in full deployment. And that, although it's having an automating effect, is also creating new opportunities. And now to the second part of your question, this transition. When we model the effect of these emerging technologies and we model the effect in different industries of the recession, and we model what the, the exit from that recession looks like, we're able to identify the supply and demand for future jobs. This means that if we're able to then pinpoint where people are today and where they will be or could be tomorrow, we can identify the skills gap. We call this the job corridor. And the job corridor allows us to identify what skills people need to affect that transition. To illustrate this with the, the example that you kindly gifted me at the, in the question, accountants and cyber. We know that we'll need many, many fewer accountants in the future because things like robotic process automation would take care of a lot of the work that accountants do today. We also know there's a global cybersecurity talent shortage. We know why that is, I don't need to explain it. It doesn't make any kind of sense for companies to be shedding accountants and paying all that money to exit those people from the organization. And at the same time, hiring cyber analysts from an ever smaller pile, when it's actually possible to train those accountants to become those cyber analysts. Much of the skills of one job are similar to the other. The gap is cyber knowledge, and that's a trainable gap. So increasingly, we're seeing companies use the Fathom platform to identify what that transfer looks like, that, that transition, that job corridor, and to affect it, and now not just at the, the company level, but increasingly often at the national level. Super. Thank you so much.